Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand, or as sometimes it happens, here in the power of Christ, I'll limp, <laughs> which is uh, what we're going to get to next. So the, Jacob, the, the life of Jacob is fairly easily divided. You can think about his, uh, his first segment, which might be a surprise to some of you, uh, is about 77 years. So when he, when he leaves for exile, he's 77 years old. It's probably not the image that you have of Jacob. Maybe you thought he was in his 30s or 40s, but when you do the math, he's actually in his mid-70s, which, relatively speaking, given how long he lived, is kind of our midlife, our 40s, we'll say. So if you're in your 40s, you're kind of where Jacob was, relatively speaking, when he left for Haran. He's not a young guy. So that's the first part. And then 20 years, he's in exile. And now we're going to meet him when he comes back. And we're going to focus on a couple of different things that happens when he, when he returns. When he left, as we talked about in the last session, at night, while he's alone, God appears to him and speaks. I am the God of your fathers and I'm your God. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to bless you. That's what God says to Jacob at the beginning of his exile in the darkness when Jacob is alone. Fast forward two decades, now he's going to come back from exile. And he's no longer alone. He's got his two wives, two co-wives, all the kids, all the servants. He's become a wealthy man while he's in exile. But when God appears to Jacob, when he returns from exile, once more Jacob is alone. And it's at night. And God is going to speak to him once more, but this is a very different scenario than the whole stairway to heaven that we encountered in the last session. Because here is the only time in the entire Bible, the only time in the entire Bible where you have a scene such as what we read about happening in this part of Jacob's life. Where he goes hand to hand, fist to fist, body to body in a wrestling match with this mysterious figure, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Only place in the entire Bible where something like this happens. And I think this scenario, more than any other part of Jacob's life, is, is so rich with an understanding of who the Son of God is that when I talk about the ministry of Jesus, I frequently actually go back to this story in Genesis to talk about what happened that night with Jacob and this man who attacked him and with whom he wrestled all night long. We'll get there in just a minute, but it's gonna set up the scene. First of all, have you ever been in a situation in life where you probably shouldn't be alone, but you are alone? And in that aloneness, you can really feel God begin to work on you. It's kind of the situation that I was in for a number of years. So after I blew up my life in my mid-30s and went from being a Hebrew professor at a seminary to being a truck driver in the oil and gas fields of the Texas Panhandle, I worked the night shift. Now, I don't know what in the world I was thinking. Let's take a guy who is in a really bad place and let's stick him in a truck cab in the middle of the night in the middle of nowhere. That sounds healthy. For hours on end, these were like 12, 14 hour shifts. So that's where I was, I was hauling wastewater away from gas wells, close to Pampa, Texas. A guy who, just, whose life was in shambles. And here I am alone most of the night working in the darkness. But turns out God didn't know what he was doing. He put me there alone in the darkness because that's where God actually began to work on me. And it's not good for the man to be alone. It's true. But it's also sometimes good for the man to be alone when God needs to work on him. No distractions. No other people around. Just you and whatever God is putting in your head or doing in your life or calling you to repentance or piecing you back together. Whatever God is doing in that aloneness, sometimes he can't do as well when you're around other people. So that's where I was. It's 
probably where some of you have been as well. And that's where Jacob's at. He's alone. It's at night. He's sent everybody across the river. And for whatever reason, maybe he just needed some time by himself. I've been with all these people, all this family. And, and I need a little time myself. Well, Jacob didn't realize what was going to happen when he set himself apart from the rest of his family. This is Genesis 32, verse 24. Then Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until daybreak. One of the startling things about this verse that unless you've been around wrestling, it's kind of hard to understand is how did they wrestle all night? Any wrestlers back in, back in the day, back in high school, maybe currently wrestling, anybody? Yeah, yeah. So my son Luke was a wrestler in high school. And those guys have gotten the mat for just a few minutes and they give it all they got. And then when they're done, they're done. <laughs> you, you don't keep wrestling. I mean, you, you need a break. These guys wrestled all night long. So they're there in the banks of the river. They're, they're going at it. They're, they're wrestling. But who is this man? Well, we have this in Genesis 32. And then the prophet Hosea is the only other place in the Bible where this same incident is referred to. And between these two, Genesis and Hosea, you have three different descriptions of who this is. He's called here an ish, which is the Hebrew word for man. It's not a special word. It just means man. So he's a man, okay? But if you go farther down, look at verse 30. At the end of this, Jacob named the place Peniel because he said, I have seen, the fa I've seen God face to face. Peniel means the face of God. I've seen God face to face, so he's called God. A man, God. And then if you turn to Hosea, Hosea also refers to him as a malach, which is sometimes translated angel, but it just means messenger. So he's a man, he's a messenger, and he's God. Now, I, I take this and see this one narrative in light of all of these other narratives we have in the Old Testament, one of which, of course, we talked about last session or the session before, whatever that was, when God appears to Jacob. All of these various scenarios, when God manifests himself visually, sometimes in some sort of physical appearance, not always as a man, sometimes as the flame of fire inside the burning bush, the messenger of the Lord appears to Hagar, or the messenger in that bush. I take all of those as the technical term are Christophanies. So a theophany appearance of God, a Christophany an appearance of Christ. This is, this is Jesus who, even though he's not yet taken on our human nature, will sometimes temporarily assume human form in order to be where his people are. And don't you love that about Jesus? When I was growing up, I had this impression. I was raised as, as, a, I was raised as a Southern Baptist. We were in church all the time. I, I, I knew the Bible. I knew all the big stories of the Old Testament. And they were edited. <laughs> I, I had to grow up and learn about drunk, naked Noah. That was not part of my Sunday school. Uh, I, did, I certainly didn't know about some of the stories in the book of Judges, even though that probably would have gotten me more interested in Sunday school, because those are some pretty interesting stories. I didn't know all these other stories, but I knew the big stories. Um, but uh, where was I going with that? Oh, but, but I, what I didn't realize is that you, you don't have to wait to the New Testament to talk about Jesus. I didn't realize that, that all through the Old Testament you have the Son of God appearing and speaking. He wasn't sitting up in heaven, twiddling his thumbs and waiting till finally the Father would say, okay, it's time. Now you can go into the world, and now you can be around humanity. That's not the way it works. Jesus is just as active in the Old Testament as he is in the New Testament. When you hear about the Lord speaking or acting or appearing, this is the Son of God. All throughout the Old Testament. Who walked in the garden in the cool of the day? The Son of God. Who appeared to Hagar in Genesis 16? The Son of God. Who appeared to Moses in the burning bush? The Son of God. Who wrestled with Jacob? The Son of God. So time and time and time again, all you, you have the same thing happening in the Gospels, except in the Gospels, now you have the incarnation. The Son of God has taken on our humanity. He is flesh and blood, not, not temporarily, but everlastingly. He has become a man. But even before then, as one author puts it, he was trying on the clothes of his incarnation. 
He was appearing temporarily in human form. So human, in fact, that in, at times he has a meal with Abraham. He eats and he drinks. Or here, he wrestles with Jacob. So this is Jacob wrestling with a, a man who's God, who's a messenger. But you can't get much more Jesus than that. Son of God wrestling with Jacob all night long while he's, while he's alone. Now, how the, how, the, how the wrestling match go? Well, verse 25 says, when he saw, there's a lot of he's in here, so I'm going to just supply the reference. When the messenger, when Jesus, we'll just, Jesus, when Jesus saw that he had not prevailed against him, when Jesus saw he had not prevailed against Jacob, then he touched the socket of Jacob's thigh. And so the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. Now, this is definitive proof beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus does not fight fair. Which is funny, and it's also very true. In fact, I know that all of us want a fair God. We think we do. You do not want a fair God. If, if, if we all had a fair God, we would all be doomed, hopeless. If you want God to deal in fairness with us, then you need to take stock of your life a little better. Because if God dealt fairly with us, that would mean that you would get what you deserve, right? That's the way fairness works. You get what you deserve when God is fair. If you get what you deserve, there's a really bad place we need to talk about because that's where you're going. That's where all of us are going. We, that's all that we deserve. If, if God is fair, then that's what just, you don't want God to be fair. So God is not only fair in the sense of he shows mercy when we deserve condemnation. He gives his own son as a sacrifice for us instead of turning us over into the hell that we deserve. So he's not only fair in that he shows mercy, he's also, he's not only not fair in showing mercy to us, he's also not fair in the way he deals with us because he's not operating according to our rules. And this is very upsetting because we're often in a situation where we're hurting and we're suffering and we feel like we're wrestling except we're being overwhelmed and beat up and we're like, this isn't fair. Life isn't fair. God, this isn't fair. What are you doing to me? Well, guess what? That's the way God operates. Read the book of Job, right? All of Job's existence during this time of suffering doesn't make any sense. And Job uses some very, very raw language to cry out to God to say, what, what are you doing? We need to talk. You, I'm your archery target here. I'm full of arrows. All these things, terrible things are happening to me. Why? Where are you? What's going on? God doesn't play fair. So just eradicate from your mind any thoughts that say, God needs to be fair with me. No, he doesn't. Not only is he not obligated to, you don't want him to be fair with you. And sometimes, as we see here, sometimes he dislocates our hips. Sometimes he does worse. He wounds and he heals. He kills and he makes a life. He doesn't work the way that we want him to work. He doesn't work the way that we think life should go. So very often he will wrestle us down and dislocate our hips and break our bones and do other things to us that hurt, physically, emotionally. But the th here's the thing to remember. That same God who wounds does heal. And that same God, in Jacob's case, who dislocates his hip, now gives Jacob, as we'll see in a second, a tremendous blessing and a tremendous name. He doesn't stop at the one, he does the other. Crucifies, resurrects wounds and heals really he does nothing more than what we see portrayed in the life of jesus jesus is crucified buried and resurrected he's wounded and he's healed in the resurrection and by his wounds we ourselves are healed so he dislocates jacob's uh the, the socket of jacob's thigh dislocates it while they're wrestling verse 26 then he said to Jacob, let me go for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said to him, I'm not going to let you go 
unless you bless me. Jacob does have a way of sticking with what he wants, doesn't he? <laughs> he, he got it from his brother. He got it from his dad. Even when he's wrestling with God, he's like, nope, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. You got to give it to Jacob. He does know how to hold on even when he is down in the mud with a dislocated hip with this guy that he, he can't ultimately overcome. So he says to him, and this is kind of a, almost a formal kind of ritual language. What is your name? And he said, Jacob. This wasn't asked out of ignorance, by the way. It's just like sometimes in weddings or in baptisms, the question will be asked, what is, what, what is your name? And it will be repeated. This is a formality. What's your name? And he says, heal, right? That's what Jacob means, heal. The verbal form can mean a, like a, someone who trips you up or someone who supplants you. So I was raised by, my dad was a cowboy, and when I was growing up, we did uh, team roping, where you have a header and then you have a healer. And if you've never done it, you've probably seen it. You know, you, the header uh, throws the rope around the horns and then dallies and then turns, and the healer comes, and the healer is throwing the loop so as to go around the back legs of the steer and then pull it tight so the steer is caught. Jacob is a healer. It's another way to think about his name. He's tripping up, he's, he's roping, he's trying to stop someone. So he's a healer. That's his name. What's your name? I'm the, the heel guy, that's who I am. And he says to him, not anymore. Your name shall no longer be called heel, Jacob. I've got a better name for you, Yisrael. Why? Because you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. I think Israel or Yisrael in Hebrew is the coolest name ever. It means God fighter. I mean, is there any better name than that? I mean, what's your name, God fighter? I mean, there's a story behind that, right? If your name God fighter is like, okay, we, you got, you got to tell me more. How'd you get this name? The E-L at the end of it means God. And then the verbal form that's part of the Yisra is to, to, stri to, to strive with, to wrestle with, to fight with. So Yisra, El, is one who fights or struggles, contends with God, which is exactly what it says here. Your name is Israel because you have striven with God and with men. And here's the surprise at the very end. And you have prevailed. Now that's shocking. It's shocking because that's not what should happen. Given the identity of this stranger, the man messenger God, given the identity of him, there's, there's no way that Jacob should have prevailed in this case. You, you, you can't fight God and win. <laughs> I mean, people try all the time, but you, it doesn't work. You're, you're, it's like, you know, throwing the, the hundred pound guy out there against the guy who weighs 250 pounds in wrestling. I don't care how good the hundred pound guy is. He's going to lose every single time. Well, when you're wrestling God, you're not going to win. There's absolutely no way it's physically possible for you to win against him. The only way you're going to win, the only way you're going to prevail against an opponent like that is by what? Cheating. <laughs> Letting him win. The, the, only way that, the, the only way that Jacob is going to prevail is by his opponent letting him win. On purpose losing so that Jacob can win. On purpose not, not overcoming his opponent so that his opponent can overcome him. In other words, Jesus willfully, and I could really add joyfully, loses this match in order that his will of giving good things to Jacob might happen. God loses purposely so that Jacob can win and he can bestow upon him a name that's really not deserved, but is still a gift from God to him. Yisrael, the God fighter, the God contender. And we're gonna come back to that in just a second. Jacob then says, what's your name? You ask me, it's a polite conversation. You ask me a question, I ask you a question. So he says, what's your name? Jacob says, Jacob. And then Jacob says, oh, 
what's your name? Please tell me your name. And he says, why are you even asking? Why is it that you ask my name? And that can either be, why are you so inquisitive? Or, don't you know? <laughs> don't you know who, what my name is? Do you not realize who you're, who you're wrestling with? And then we're told that he blessed him there. So then, verse 30, Jacob names the place Peniel because he said to his own shock and delight, I've seen not just this mysterious man, I've seen God, God face to face, and I'm still alive. That is the ongoing surprise of many people in the Old Testament where they'll have this encounter and maybe at first they don't know it's God and then they realize it's God afterward and they're like, I'm still here. I wasn't, I wasn't killed because that, the expectation is if you see God, you're going to die. And when these people don't die, because God has a let them see him, he's, he's, he's appeared in a capacity that isn't going to destroy them. Then they're always surprised. They're like, I'm still alive. Jacob is surprised. He's seen God face to face, and yet he has, his life has been preserved. Now, verse 31, and we're going to come back to some of this. Now, the sun rose upon him just as he crossed over Penuel, and he was limping on his thigh. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites don't eat the sinew of the hip, which is on the socket of the thigh, because he touched the socket of Jacob's thigh in the sinew of the hip. Now that last verse seems a little bit strange to us. It's like, why is that there? This, this, you know, this little culinary type detail that's added at the very end of the story. And I think it's this. So every generation after this narrative, you know, a father and a son say they're, they're butchering something. And they get to that point and the dad's like, no, 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 we don't, we don't eat that. And the son says, why? And the dad says, well, let me tell you a story. It becomes an ongoing way of fathers teaching sons. It's an ongoing way by refraining from that, that the story is passed on from generation to generation. So that where God touched Jacob, that not only affected Jacob, it affects every generation after after that. Now, the way I like to take that part of the story is to talk about how when, when God touches each of us, in fact, you could, you could even say when God touches uh, our father or our grandfather and there's a limp, there's a scar, there's, there's something that remains after that divine touch then we're called upon not to kind of sweep that under the carpet, not to forget about it, but instead to live in the light of where God has caused us to limp or where he's wounded us or where he's left a scar. And the way I like to describe it is we're called to be stewards of our scars. You see, I had a, I had a choice to make at one point in my life. And the choice was this. I could either take everything that I had done wrong in my life and how badly I had wrecked it and to conceal that and just kind of, kind of shove it into the back of my mind or to be honest about that and public about that and in that way to take this scar which in my own case was self-caused, and to steward that in such a way that I could be hope, a source of hope and encouragement to others. And I'd encourage you to do the same. You all have scars. Some of them people know about, some of them people don't know about. But one of the best things that we can do is to take what we've experienced, especially if it's painful, Maybe it's something like cancer, or maybe it was something like the loss of a child, or maybe it was the loss of a marriage or the loss of a parent, or you know what it is in your own life. And to take that 
and to come alongside other people when they're going through it or even before they go through it and say, let's talk. Let me tell you what happened to me and then let me, on the basis of that, show you how God was active in the midst of all those things that happened to me. And he will be active in your life during the same. When you do that, you're stewarding your scars. You're stewarding your limp. You're, you're actually taking the comfort that you yourself have received from God and then sharing that with someone else. Or you're taking the wisdom, often a hard acquired wisdom that you have received on the basis of what you've experienced. And then you're using that to help other people. It's the same thing I did with uh, the loss of Luke. I mean, it, it, it's hard to talk about. Uh, it's getting a little bit easier. Luke died in July of 2022, so it's been almost two years. So, of course, it's, it's an emotional subject to talk about. It's very hard to talk about the loss of your child. But I decided pretty early on that I was going to, as hard as it is. I was going to incorporate that into my teaching and into my writing and into things like this because what I begin to realize is that it's very hard for some people to put into words what they're feeling. And if I could do that for them, God be praised. It's very hard for some people to have any hope when you've experienced a loss like that. And I wanted to steer people toward that resurrection hope that we have as Christians so that they can be rescued from the dark pit of despair into which people so easily fall when they've lost something so precious to them. So in my own life, as hard as it is, whether it's from embarrassment because of failures or simply pain because of loss, you take that and you look at it and you're like, you know, I would just as soon throw that behind me and walk away and forget about it. Instead, I hold it in front of me and I say, okay, how has God used this in my life to teach me about me and to teach me about others and most importantly to teach me about himself? And then how can I use that to aid other people, to be the one who gives them encouragement or one who gives them hope or the one who gives them warning in some cases or whatever it is, how can I steward that scar? And encourage you to think about how you can, how you can do the same. Now back to the story of Jacob. Here's one thing, one, one takeaway that, that I never talk about this without making this point about it. I think what's happening in this entire scenario of the wrestling at night and the giving of the name, all of that you can think of as a, uh, as a, as a keyhole. And, and you look through this keyhole, like one of those old keyholes, you know, the big ones that you can kind of see through and into the other room. And what you see in the other room is the room of the crucifixion. And here's what I mean. Jacob was able to get his hands on God to wrestle with him. And ultimately, God let him win in order that God could bestow a blessing upon Jacob. That's the entire ministry of Jesus. That's what's going on in the entire life of Jesus. He's wrestling with his people. He's come down again, except this time he's permanently assumed our humanity. And he wrestles with the scribes and the Pharisees and his own disciples. There's this fighting back and forth, grappling. Until finally, it reaches its climax when his own people, all of humanity, pins him to the cross. And he lets that happen. He lets that happen. My father... Your will be done. And it is. He's pinned to the cross and he willingly loses his own life in order that we might win. So we have a God who's willing to lose in order that we might win a new name. And that new name, you can call it several things. You can call it Christian. You can call it forgiven. You can call it beloved. You can call it righteous. All of those are our new names that none of us have deserved but that are freely bestowed upon us because God willingly lost. He's here to go all the way into the loss of life itself in order that he might bestow upon us this new identity, 
this new name, that we are called the children of God, that we are called the beloved, righteous, and forgiven people of God. That's what you see happening in this short narrative about Jacob wrestling in the dark with this mysterious stranger who ultimately becomes not only one of us, but not just a stranger, but a friend of sinners who willingly gives himself up in order that we might get everything that he wants us to have. Now, with keeping in mind everything that just happened to Jacob, new name, wins this, this mysterious wrestling match, has what we today would call a, should be like a life-changing religious experience, right? Have you ever had a religious experience that you've never forgotten? You tell people about it, you still remember it? Yeah. That's what Jacob just had. Wouldn't you think that if you have that kind of experience, you're never going to be the same person again. You're altered. You, you're, you're not going to be who you were before. So isn't that what's going to happen to Jacob? Well, what happens immediately after this, next day? Well, what, what happens the next day is he, he finally has the reunion with his brother he's been worrying about, right? 20 years have passed. Now, Jacob, you know, he hasn't been his brother's Facebook page to see how things are going. You know, he doesn't have, he doesn't have any clue what's been going on with Esau. So what does he assume about Esau? That he's still mad. That he's still out for blood. That's his assumption about his brother. And so he, he, he starts this whole scenario, you know, where he's sending gifts ahead and trying to, you know, curry favor with his brother before they actually meet. And he, because earlier his, his messenger had come back and said, yeah, your brother's coming to meet you. And there's 400 men with him. 400 men is the biblical size of a militia. So like the, that's the size of like a small army. Esau is not just coming by himself. He's got all these soldiers who could just easily wipe out Jacob and his entire entourage. So Jacob's scared. So he sends all of these presents ahead of time. And then when it comes time to meet Esau, he, he, uh, he actually goes in front of his entire family. Kudos to, to, to Jacob. And he bows down all these times to his brother. And he's calling him Lord, Lord, Lord. A little, little detail there. Every time Esau never calls him Lord. He calls him my brother. But Jacob keeps calling him my Lord, my Lord, my Lord. He's, even though he's supposed to be the younger who's over the older, you wouldn't know it from this scenario. I mean, he is very, <laughs> he's very humble before his brother. And then we get to their actual reunion and we have the shock of our life because Genesis 33, 4 says that Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. Side note here. That entire story, I'm convinced, is the background of the parable of the prodigal son. We have a father, older and younger brothers squabble over the inheritance. The younger son goes into a far off country and then comes back. Except there's a surprising switch because here it's the older brother who comes to greet and to to wrap his arms around the younger brother. It's the father, of course, who does that in the parable of the prodigal son. So in a very surprising twist, Esau becomes the figure of the father in this Old Testament version. Quite surprising. But this is, this is Esau. He's, he's not been waiting to get his desserts. He's not been waiting to get revenge. He's been waiting for his brother to come home. It's one of these shocking one-way love episodes where you get the exact opposite of what you expect to get. This is, this is by the way, this is one more, one more incident of divine mercy, except here it's God through Esau showing mercy to Jacob. He's not there to exact revenge. He's to give grace and, and to embrace his brother. Now, here's the part I want to get to, and we'll, we'll close with this. After this reunion, and they talk, you know, who tells about family and all these things, what does Esau say? Remember this part of the story? Esau says, brother, come with me to my home. Come to Seir. Come south with me. And 
uh, he says, you know, I, I'll leave some of my men with you. They'll escort you. Everything will be good. And, and Jacob's like, I'm just paraphrasing. This is the Chad Bird paraphrase. Thanks, brother. Appreciate the invitation. Uh, I tell you what, we, I got my wife and my kids and all the animals, so we're going to be really slow. So why don't you go ahead of us and we'll catch up with you. And Esau's like, okay, sounds good. So Esau, Esau heads south. And then no sooner does Esau and his men disappear before Jacob says, all right, let's pack up. We're going north. Now this is, keep in mind, this is the day after the nighttime wrestling match with Jesus. This is the day after Jacob had the most profound religious experience of his life. And once more, he deceives his brother. Once more, he, he lies about his brother. He goes the opposite direction. You know, they, they, meet in, uh, they meet in Michigan, and Esau heads toward Ohio, and Jacob heads toward Canada. He's going to put as much distance between him and his brother as possible. Because it turns out that Jacob, even though he has a new name, Israel, is still Jacob. It turns out that this... this Profound religious experience was very real, but Jacob's realness as a sinner is still there. And the reason, in a, in, a, in, a, in a kind of twisted sort of way, I suppose you could say, the reason I like that is because that's, who, that's us. The reformers had a phrase in, in Latin. They called us simul justus et peccator, which means simultaneously justified and a sinner. Simultaneously justified and a sinner. That's Jacob. That's, that's all of us. That's the Romans 7. The good that I want to do, I don't do. And the bad that I don't want to do, that's what I do. Why? Because there's a civil war raging inside every single one of us. Between the Jacob as Jacob and then the Israel as Israel. And these two clash against each other all the time. And so, yes, this was a profound religious experience. And yet Jacob is still Jacob. And we'll see, I mean, you go further into the, the rape of his daughter and Jacob's passivity, gross passivity during that entire thing. And you see, he's still Jacob. Now, I'm not saying he's, he's, he's not saved. Of course he's saved. He's, he's a believer. He has this new name, Israel, but he's also still Jacob. He's both in one person, just like all of us are. So we struggle and we live a life of repentance and we pray God for his mercy and his strength to do the right thing. And when we don't do the right thing, we ask for his forgiveness. We confess. We repent. And the beautiful thing about our God is that he never tires. He's never, he, he never says, I'm tired of forgiving you. Never says that. He never says, I, listen, I forgave you yesterday for that. He continues to forgive because we continue to sin. Uh, not, it's not right. It's wrong. It's, it's, it's contrary to God's will. And yet, we don't have a God who says, listen, you've run out of repentance chances. I gave you 20 yesterday. We have a God who beckons us to repent, to confess, and who joyfully forgives us. Just like he did Jacob, so he does for us as well.